I am thrilled to welcome two esteemed guests today from the Edison Group. Edison Group provides equity research, global distribution, and intent data that drives investor relationships. With me today is Neil Shaw, the Executive Director of Content and Strategy, and Pratchik Yao, Managing Director of Strategic Investor Relations. And in the next 20 minutes, we'll un unpack the evolution of shareholder composition, how this has impacted IR programs and strategies, and investor communication and targeting strategies. Welcome, Neil and Patrick. Thanks very much for having us. Thank you so much for joining. Now, before we get started, let me properly intro both of you for our listeners. Neil has been at Edison for the last 20 years, leading the analyst teams as executive director of content and strategy and establishing the firm as a leading issuer sponsored research firm. He has also led the firm's thought leadership on the equity research market. Patrick joined as managing director, investor relations in November, 2021. He has worked at several bulge bracket and mid-cap broking houses, including Credit Suisse, Nomura, and Peel Hunt. In 2013, he became head of IR at Entertainment One until its acquisition in 2019, and was most recently director of IR at Series Power. I'm so excited to have both of you on the podcast today, and there is so much to cover, so let's dive right in. Both of you have been in various positions across the capital markets ecosystem. I would like to open with your thoughts on the evolution of the IR program over the years from your perspective. Let me start with the regulatory side and just how we've seen that change. Then perhaps we can bring Patrick in as a IR practitioner. If you cast your eye back to maybe 40 years ago, there are statistics that the UK is currently highlighting that in the 1960s, 50% of stock ownership was actually in retail hands. Today, that's dwindled down to 12%. That's true in other markets as well. Markets are never static and they do respond to regulatory change. Probably one of the biggest regulatory changes that we've seen is in the sort of pension arena where under the bonnet, regulators want people to get a decent return for their money and have so driven providers towards lower cost products. So you've seen the growth of, in particular, passive on the register against active institutions. But we're also starting to see much more uh, diversification in the sort of makeup of the shareholder ba base. One, you're seeing more sort of family office and wealth managers starting to turn up onto the share registers and those constituents continue to gather assets. And then particularly post the pandemic, you've seen a little bit of a resurgence in terms of the retail investor returning and also starting to participate on shareholders, holder registers. And we can get into the details, but if your IR strategy is just about targeting institutional investors, you are missing large swathes of capital. And the other complication is that it used to be much easier to access international investors MIFID 2 in particular has made that a little bit more tricky. So you need to distinguish between your domestic institutions and your international investors. I would say that I'd echo those, those thoughts. And on the IR side, I grew up in an environment, not quite 40 years ago, but not far from it, where retail investors were being encouraged to be active participants in the markets. So I grew up in a time of privatizations of the, the British gas industry, the British telecoms industry, utilities, and so on. Uh, and there was a huge drive towards encouraging the retail part of the market through broad government advertising campaigns to, to be participants. And I think in, in the intervening time, the, the representation of retail has steadily declined, I think, because quite often they're seen as the poor relations in the in investment cycle. Now, as Neil points out, as we went through COVID and as means of getting access to information and means of speaking to companies arguably became easier in the digital world in some respects. Um, there has been a resurgence in the retail end of the market. And we can talk, uh, I'm sure we will in a little bit, about why that's important. But where we are now, I think the, the retail market is, is poised for, for even more of a, of a voice around the investment tables. And companies need to be aware of that. And in fact, that voice represents a huge opportunity for them. Those are great observations and comments there. So let's unpack that a little bit more in terms of what you've seen in the changes of composition of ownership for corporate issuers. We mentioned COVID, so obviously that impacted a lot of how 
investors interact with corporations, but what other sort of market conditions or industry trends have influenced the evolution of shareholder composition? So, so COVID was a, a big one. I think two things happened as a result of COVID. Number one was that companies who had to talk about their outlooks were facing a once in a lifetime type event. And so there's a high level of uncertainty in terms of what was going to happen to their business for 2020, 2021, and how they were dealing with it, particularly in those businesses that were acutely uh, uh, impacted by COVID. And I think the response that we typically saw out of the corporates was to really up their game in terms of making sure that they communicated more with the market about all the uncertainties so that people were aware of them. The other thing we saw was that it really accelerated digital communications. So the old way of having a conference call or an in-person results briefing was transformed into Zoom and Teams meetings. More and more people were accustomed to talking to a wider audience over a channel like Zoom or a webinar. And I, I think that's probably one of the most pronounced changes we've seen in terms of how companies have changed in terms of interacting with investors. As they did that, they suddenly started to get aware of, it just so happened that at the same time, you saw quite a big pickup in retail engagement in the stock market. And so you also found channels of communication to start tackling that particular audience as well. My view is that with the audience being there, companies and their advisors have had to think quite hard on how to innovate their communication strategy to be able to tap into those various uh, pools of interest. For some parts of the market, producing long research notes with lots of detail in them and financial modeling and so on is absolutely the right, the right way to get interest, particularly you know, amongst the uh, conventional institutional investors. However, some of the, the, the retail investors are on different platforms. They may be on social media, they may be on share platforms, or, or they may be uh, on direct mailing lists from people who operate websites and, and so on. So how do you tap into those pockets of interest with arguably different and more engaging types of content? And those are the areas where we spend quite a lot of our time concentrating to make sure that as well as providing the core institutional style research product that we do, and the high levels of content there. Well, you know, are there other means of engaging with shorter form content, perhaps snappier messaging, a different type of language even, and a different approach to tap into an audience with very different dynamics from the conventional institutional marketplace? That's where we, we are today, where the, the means of communication has become a lot easier. People have become media pluralists in a way, one second jumping from email, into social media, into LinkedIn, into platforms and others. And as, uh, as communication advisors and specialists are, are looking for ways to, to make sure that the messages from our corporates cuts through in the right way on the right platform to the right investor. Right. So you're really adjusting your communication strategies dependent on who you really want to talk to. And I like your term of a, being a media pluralist. It's like, you have TikTok, like you said, you need the little snackable bites, you need to keep them engaged, or you may have something like blogs or Reddit. And yeah. speaking of, of Reddit, I'm not sure if you guys saw, but there was a new movie release called Dumb Money, and it covers the GameStop and a fiasco that happened two years ago. And I, for one, I can't believe that was already two years ago. It feels like yesterday when I was watching this happen. But let's talk a little bit more about the rise of the retail investor for a little bit. Um, what sort of changes have you observed in the behavior or the preferences of retail investors in recent years? Let me start, then Patrick could add into mm. that. I haven't watched the movie, for, but I'm clearly aware of the the episodes around the meme stalls. And what I would say that I would characterize those as an extreme of what we would typically characterize as the typical retail investor. I think that that situation underlying firstly a, a broader theme which is that liquidity is at a premium right now so markets are much thinner today than they were maybe 15 years ago and 20 years ago and and in part that is because there's less capital been deployed in the market making operations of, of banks and they, they prepared to carry less risk 
as a result, what you're finding is that institutional investors, because of compliance reasons for their own risk management, have typically moved further up the market cap scale. And so you do see these, you know, particularly on the smaller stocks, you, you can see that retail can be a dominant force and shift price in a way that they might not have been able to. And tying into Patrick's point around platforms, they also have the today's tools, which allows them to give them give themselves a voice. So a platform like Reddit or WhatsApp groups or YouTube channels are giving a voice to those retail investors. However, the vast majority of retail investors, I would say, are, tend to be much more long-term in their nature and outlook in terms of where they're investing. We have seen a pickup in retail investors participating in equities as a result of the, the, the pandemic. They had savings which they're looking to deploy. They were discovering names on the market. And I heard from a number of ECM uh, counterparts that a lot of the IPOs that uh, got away in 2020 and 2021 wouldn't have got away had it not been for the retail tranches that were allocated to them. And that helped complete the book build and, and allowed companies to raise the sort of target mm -hmm. levels of capital. So my, my sense is that retail is a resurging force and is something that companies need to deal with. 20 years ago, it used to be considered as not a great thing because they tend to introduce volatility in the share price. I would say that the converse is true today, which is that they participate in stocks, they're generating liquidity in a stock, and actually that's valuable. So it's a constituent which I think is worth addressing, but hopefully you're not in the extreme end of a game stock or, or one of the other meme stocks when you're addressing it. Mm. I think there have been some really interesting changes in behavior amongst the retail marketplace. And I think now is a very exciting time to be a retail investor. When I first started out in broking in, in what seems like a million years ago now, but it wasn't that long ago, I started working at a, a private client brokerage. And the retail investors who made up the client base would be relatively sit back in their attitude. They would listen to their brokers telling them about what they should or shouldn't be invested in or how their portfolios should be structured. And, and they would discuss risk factors and the types of things that they liked and didn't like and so on. But they were really happy to sit back and take advice. I think these days we've seen the retail guys become much, much more active. I think information has become easier to come by. Um, they're being serviced by a number of platforms and content producers like ourselves with information in the format that they like and they find engaging. And they now have a genuine seat at the table when it comes to influencing a company's stock price performance. In my first role, only about 5% of the shareholder base was in retail. And it struck me that, okay, if you look at our shareholder list, you've got some big institutions at the top end of the share register who have absorbed maybe 50 or 60% of the, the company's liquidity. So those big guys who everybody chases and wants on their register, they're there, but they've made their bets and they're happy just to sit there and wait for the performance of the company to come through. In that scenario, there's not a huge amount of liquidity there for the day-to-day -day trading. And that's where the retail guys are so important. They do provide that liquidity. And when you provide liquidity, you also provide direction and momentum to a stock price in both directions. So I think now is a great time to, to be that retail investor because you can access information so easily. Companies are keen to speak to you because companies now appreciate the benefits of having a, a, a reasonable chunk of the register in retail hands. And it's, to me, it seems like a win-win situation. That's really interesting. I never really thought about viewing the retail investor as the one that helps drive the momentum of the stock, whether it's up or down. We saw with game stock, like they shot through the roof, even though the fundamentals hadn't changed at all. But it was just crazy to watch how high that price went in one day. Then just thinking about retail investors and them harnessing a little bit more power when it comes to influence, what have you seen in terms of increased interest on impact investing or need for transparency on climate risk and those sort of sustainability issues? It's one of the things that we've observed um, as this sort of resurgence of retail investors has happened is that you're bringing in a different demographic to the one that used to uh, participate. If you used to characterize 
our audience as late forties, mid fifties, and you know, looking after sort of savings pots and in terms of their investment profile, we've seen more younger investors starting to appear. And one, there's a need for education and handholding, but this is a group of investors who care about the sustainability agenda and do look for information on what a company is doing in terms of its net zero targets, what it's doing from an ESG perspective. I don't think they are experts, sustainability experts. I think it's a, a high level, how is this company actually improving uh, itself uh, from a sustainability perspective or an ESG perspective? I would add to that, that it's for some investors, the way they invest reflects the way they live their lives. And the Neil's right is that the younger investors we're seeing coming through now, the millennials and even some of the, the older Gen, Z, Gen Zers or Gen Zers, they care about their environment. They care about sustainability and these issues and where they work. They want the companies they work for to have similar values to those and who they bank with and, and who they invest with you also need to be consistent with their own values as people these days. And, and that's becoming much, much more important. So our challenge and our mandate is to reach those people uh, and educate them and bring investment stories to them that are in line with what their own values are. And that's part and parcel of what we do uh, every day. Exactly. In their last episode, I interviewed a Gen Zer who's an analyst at Ball Corp. Her name is Miranda Villa Vincencio, and she echoed the exact same comments. I asked her, uh, when you think about how you spend your time or how you spend your money, how does climate risk or human rights, how does that play into your decisions on how to spend your time and money? And she's like, it very much has to align with her core values, right? Is my time being spent, is my money being spent on things that really align with what I want to see reflected, you know, in the, in the larger world? So I thought that was interesting and you guys are, are spot on. And again, coming from directly from Gen Z saying that about how they spend their investments. Mm -hmm. And so tying all this together, how does the shift in these investor behaviors you have increased pressure for regulatory requirements. How does that change the way how IR groups should think about investor engagement? Let me take this one first. I think there is a fundamental shift going on at the moment in that if you're a company and you choose to ignore this part of the market and you don't want to go for the retail and, and you, you still choose to focus on on the larger investors, then you can miss out on quite a big opportunity. We've talked about liquidity. We've talked about momentum and direction. I would recommend that investors in the broadest spectrum should be considered. And there are different investor types that will be relevant and important to companies at different stages of their development as well. So that needs to be thought about. The regulatory um, environment is shifting very much towards making more information available in the right way to to investors. I mean, we haven't really talked about the UK Investment Research Review, but that's all geared towards that provision of information. So I think you, as a company, you ignore that at your peril because you can be missing out in quite large chunks of the investment marketplace. And those people you're missing out on may well be very interested in your particular story. To add to that, I think that there are threads developing, which is but to address that constituent is just seen as part of good governance and companies, all companies want to continue improving their governance. We see extremes in terms of approach. So there are still companies who will only make their management team available to their top 20 shareholders or the top 30 institutional shareholders. And at the other extreme, you do have companies who are thinking about, look, how do I engage with my the retail constituent? They make the fireside chats with their CEO available on their websites. Um, they find other plat platforms to communicate with those um, retail investors. A lot of companies today will do the analyst briefing, but will do a separate retail briefing that a lot of companies also do. And you're starting to see a sort of change in behavior. I think IROs need to start thinking about that constituent as and in of, of their audience and how they make sure that they stay informed with what the company's doing. Right. 
Thank you guys so much. I'm running short on a little bit of time here. So I just wanted to close out this podcast with one final word from our experts. What is one piece of advice you would give our listeners when it comes to investor management? Patrick, do you want to start with that? Yeah, I would echo what I said just a few moments ago and say, ignore this retail investor group at your peril as a company. They are are an important component of the market. And if you're not sure or if you need support on how to communicate most effectively with them, then we're here to help assist you. And I would say that uh, based on my 20 years of working in this business, don't remain static. The market is always changing and evolving. There are always new trends, both in terms of how we communicate, but also the audience that we're communicating to. So don't get trapped in terms of keeping with a static program. Always look to challenge and think about how you can improve that for for the very different world that we're going to face tomorrow. The world is always changing. Thank you to our special guests, Patrick Yao and Neil Shaw. It was a pleasure to have your insights and point of view. I hope our listeners gain some actionable insights on shareholder composition and communication in order to better engage with your investors. If you like this content, please subscribe. And until next month, take care.